Well, I'm excited to, uh, to jump into uh, part two here of our Christmas season today. And uh, I wanted to start with an article I read about Finland. Anyone ever been to Finland? Let's see some of you Finns. No. Oh, no. One back there. All right. All right. So I don't know a lot about Finland, but I'm reading this article this week. And uh, in Finland, they take Christmas pretty seriously. And they've got this tradition that they started back in the 1300s. And it's called the Christmas Declaration of Peace. Never heard of this before. Found it very fascinating. Each year at noon on Christmas Eve, this Christmas peace is declared in the city. And this proclamation is read usually by a city official from the balcony of like a historic mansion at the center of town, kind of town square type thing. And it's meant to get everybody's attention. It's broadcast on the radio. It's broadcast on television. And of course, nowadays you can stream it on the Internet. And this declaration uh, of peace serves as a reminder and encouragement to spend Christmas in peace and it also threatens offenders with harsh punishments. Like, if you interrupt the peace during Christmas, you're going to get in trouble, right? And so I want to read a little bit of it to you. It says this, this proclamation says, Tomorrow, God willing, is the graceful celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, and thus is declared a peaceful Christmas time to all by advising devotion and to behave otherwise quietly and peacefully, because he who breaks this peace and violates the peace of Christmas shall be punished according to what the law and statutes prescribe. Finally, a joyous Christmas feast is wished to all the inhabitants of the city. They're basically saying, hey, you better not mess with our peace this Christmas or you will be dealt with harshly. And I was thinking that maybe for some of us, especially with kids, we should make a similar declaration uh, to our kids on Christmas Eve and then add something like this, and thou shall not waketh up until about 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. How many, how many like that? I think we should add that. And for some, for some of us, our families, we, before we sit down over Christmas dinner, we might want to make a declaration of peace and harshly warn uh, anyone that if they mess this thing up, there's going to be trouble. But when we think about the story of the first Christmas in our Bibles, there is also a declaration of peace that is declared at the birth of Jesus. It was like the angels were announcing, hey, everybody, peace has arrived. Peace is here. Let's go to Luke chapter 2 and let's read a little bit of the Christmas story together this morning. We're going to start in verse 2. It says, It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And why did he go? Well, he went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord, it shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying in verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So again, this declaration of peace is a big deal here at the first Christmas. The angel says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. But if we are to look around the world today, we would say, you know what? It doesn't really seem like there is a lot of peace. In, in fact, if we track most of human history, you will not find very many periods of total peace around the world Historians tell us there just really haven't been, uh, you know, many times where 
someone somewhere wasn't fighting against someone else somewhere. It might be nation against nation. It might be tribe against tribe. It might be family even against family. But there always seems to be conflict somewhere. So as much as the first coming of Christ is heralded by this announcement, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, it's like oh, something wrong here. <laughs> it doesn't seem like there's a lot of peace. It seems like peace is actually pretty difficult to find. And so we have to, we have to ask ourselves, what, what's the problem here? Either, either he brought peace or he didn't bring peace, or, or maybe the peace that we're thinking about is not the peace that he's talking about. I, I don't know if you've uh, ever experienced uh, something you probably have, or maybe somebody you know, someone in your family, where they think something means something, but it actually doesn't mean that. It means something else. Anybody ever had that? Like my mom, bless her heart, when uh, when she first got a cell phone and she began texting. Uh, old people in texting, I I, I love it. Uh, no offense, and and we don't have any old people here. You're you're all very young, very young. But uh, but uh, when when my mom started texting, she didn't know what some of the shorthand, some of the abbreviations meant. And and LOL to her was uh, lots of love. And LOL to me was laugh out loud, and, and so there was some confusing moments. And I would say, hey, hey, Mom, pray for Aunt Mary. She's not feeling well at all. And Mom would respond, will do, LOL. <laughs> I don't know if that's appropriate, Mom. Uh, next day, hey, Mom, Aunt Mary's got worse she actually got admitted to the hospital, and, and on top of that, as Uncle Bob was going to see her, he wrecked the car, and she says, oh my, I hate to hear this, LOL. <laughs> Mom, I don't think it means what you think it means, and when we talk about peace on earth, goodwill toward men, I, I'm not sure that it means what we think it means. I, I think there's something different here. The peace spoken about is, is not necessarily peace among all people on the planet. And you will drive by a churches and you'll see pray for world peace. And that's, that's a noble prayer. And that, that'd be awesome that, that we had world peace. But I, I don't think that's exactly what this, this declaration of peace is talking about. I, I believe it's a different kind of peace. In fact, I think it's two different kinds of peace. There's, there's two different kind of peace that we can have. And when the first coming of Jesus came, we, we celebrate this, these two gifts of peace that he brought. One is peace with God, and the other is the peace of God. So one is peace with God, and the other is the peace of God. First, let's talk about peace with God. Colossians 1 and verse 19. Look at this scripture with me. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell, and by Jesus to reconcile all things to himself, and by Jesus, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The blood of his cross made peace. Verse 21, And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled or he has brought you back into the family in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Many people don't understand that when Adam sinned, you know, the guy all the way back, first book of the Bible, Garden of Eden, when he sinned, he caused a separation between God and man. Some people call that original sin. Others might call it the fall of man. We have to understand that even though our God is good and loving and he loves his creation with an incredible love, he is also holy. He is also a God of justice and his justice requires him to judge sin. Our sinfulness caused a breach between God and man. But on the cross of Christ, Jesus made peace between us by shedding his own blood. Now, often here at Crossroads, we talk about the suffering of the cross and the abuse that Jesus took on our behalf. It reminds us of the price that he paid for us. And I think it's good and it's right that we would remember his sacrifice. And even though we talk about those things and his suffering was very real, it's also important for us to understand that on the, Christ, or on the cross of Calvary, Jesus was not a victim. Do you know that? He was not a victim. 
He willingly laid down his life, and when he did, he healed the broken relationship between God and man. And when he said, it is finished, that was not a cry of giving up. That was a declaration of victory. He is Christus Victor, Christ our victory. For on the cross, he removed the enmity that once existed between God and man. And here's the good news for us this morning. God is not mad at us. (laughs) And what the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of the spotless lamb of God did on the cross. The uh, the power of sin was totally conquered. And you and I have been released from its hold. And a brand new way of living has been created. We are not mostly forgiven. We are totally forgiven. We are not made just a little bit better. We are made brand new. And all of that is done because Jesus walked the road, the Via Della Rosa of suffering and he died on the cross. His blood was shed and it made peace between God and man. That's, that's, that's the first gift that we received at the first coming of Christ is this, this peace with God. Now, once you have peace with God, then you can have the peace of God. And you can't. You'll never have the peace of God until you have peace with God. You got to do this in order. You've got to do it in order. We're going to go to the book of John for a moment. And in the book of John, we find a, an entire block of teaching done by Jesus that is spread out over several chapters. And this is called the Upper Room Discourse. This is the longest continuous block of teaching done by Jesus. And he's doing this before he's arrested and before the chain events begin that will lead ultimately to his crucifixion. So his disciples are getting ready to live through one of the scariest times of their lives. Uh, You know, theologians believe that most of the disciples were pretty young men, possibly even teenagers. And their leader, Jesus, is about to be taken into custody. He's going to stand trial. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be killed. And for them, they are going to run in fear because they are thinking, we're next. If they took our leader... They did all this to him. We are next. So these men, they're going to walk through some pretty scary stuff here. And it's in this context that Jesus does this extended uh, time of teaching in order to prepare them for what they're about to walk through. And I want you to see what he says here in John 14 and verse 27. Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now again, understand the ask here. Understand the context. And this seems like Jesus maybe is even being a bit unreasonable. (laughs) What, what do you mean, Jesus? You're telling us to let not our hearts be troubled. Don't let our hearts be afraid. But you're also telling us that over the next few hours, you're going to be taken into custody. You're going to be beaten. And, and, and the next day, you're going to be killed. And we're going to run for our lives. What are you talking about? <laughs> How can you tell us to let not our hearts be troubled? How can you tell us to not be afraid when we know that this is, this is coming in the next few hours, Jesus, this seems like an unreasonable instruction. Your boys are about to live through the scariest experience of their young lives, and you tell them, hey guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. How could Jesus give such a bold command? Well, it's because of the first part of the verse. Look at it again. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus is saying, guys, you don't have to muster up this peace on your own. This is not a peace that you produce. This peace is a gift from me. I am giving you my own personal peace. Remember, not only is Jesus or the disciples about to face some difficult times, but Jesus is the one who's going to be facing torture. And the same peace that he has, he is gifting to his disciples. And do you know what? That exact same peace has been gifted to you and I. 
Today in this room are some families going through some really, really difficult circumstances. I, it's, it's almost overwhelming the past few weeks, the prayer requests and the situations that have come up in our, in our congregation, in our church family. And it's just like one thing after another, after another, after another. And, and it's easy to get overwhelmed, but we have to bring ourselves back to the truth of God's word. And I, I don't want to minimize anyone's situation here this morning. My heart hurts for those who are hurting. But I also have to tell you here today, as we look ahead to Christmas and we celebrate the Christ that came, there is a supernatural peace that has been given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that peace is going to be the anchor of your soul through this storm. I want to tell somebody today, you are not going to fall apart part. You are not going to lose your mind because there is a peace that is greater than your circumstances and the same God that spoke the world into existence is the same God that saved you and the same God that saved you is the same God that is going to keep you. Rain will come and storms and winds were going to blow but God has given you a peace to uphold you through every single one of them. That is God's truth. It's God's truth. We have to every time... <laughs> When, when the doctor says something, when, when a job loss happens, when a marriage starts going crazy, if you don't have God's truth hidden in your heart, you will fall apart. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that we take the word of God, that we meditate on it, that we allow it to be that anchor, that we come back to truth over and over and over again. Because how many know our minds will drive us crazy? Anybody else or just me? So we got to have some sort of anchor for our souls to bring us back. And Jesus says, my peace I give to you not as the world gives. There is a false peace that this world and its systems offer, but it's only temporary. It's fleeting. It fades quickly. Sometimes false peace comes through a relationship. You know, romantic love can be awesome. Should have cleaned these earlier because I really thought that with all the married people sitting in the room today, when the preacher makes a, a, a statement, a declaration, gives you an opportunity and says, you know, romantic love can be awesome, I thought there would be an overwhelming response. That Christmas list just got shorter and shorter. You men, you get nothing. Hey, my wife and I celebrated 33 years of marital bliss <laughs> this week. So happy anniversary. Thank my wife for putting up with me. But listen, if you believe you can find peace for your soul through romance, you will be disappointed. I don't care how cute she is, she ain't Jesus. Listen, I don't care how strong his jawline looks now, ladies. Eventually, he'll have a double chin. He ain't Jesus. Come on, somebody. He just, he's just not. She's just not. Sometimes temporary peace comes through money. Let's be honest. Sometimes when you got enough of it, you feel pretty good. But you know what? Money has a, a funny way of growing wings and, 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 and flying away. It's just like it could be here today and gone this afternoon. Never, never find your peace through a bank account. It's false. It's temporary. It, it, will, it will go. The world we live in tries to offer us peace, but it, it's all temporary. Jesus is the peace that I give you. The world cannot duplicate this peace. There is no substitute for the peace I give. So this peace is an awesome gift from our Savior. But one thing that I have continued to learn, I'm still learning over the years, is that with any gift that God gives us, you and I become stewards of the gift. The word stewards means we manage it. And so even though God has given us the gift of peace, you and I manage that peace sometimes through the choices that we make. Our choices need to line up with God's peace. Look at Philippians 4. A very familiar passage of scripture here, but it certainly applies to this gift of peace. Philippians 4 verse 6 says... 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here's the result, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will then guard. That is a military term, like God will set up this guard around your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. So prayer is a choice that we make, and, and, and through prayer we, we make this choice to hold our peace. I think I've had to pray more this past year of my life than, than probably any other time in my life. I, I don't know why. It just, past year has just been like circumstance after circumstance and multiple times a day. I just, I just have to keep bringing situations back to the Lord and, and just saying, okay, okay, Father, I, I just give you this person. I can't change this person. I can't fix this person. I can't, I just gonna, I'm, just, I'm just bringing this person back to you. And, and every time, I, you know, you get worried, you get stressed, you just got to bring that prayer request, bring that person, bring that situation. Okay, all right, God, I'm just lifting up this situation to you over and over and over again. And, and that was at breakfast, and now at lunch, here it is again. And, and Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do about this thing. I'm just going to bring it to you again. I've had to fight to hold on to my peace. But you know what? The battle was always won through prayer. It's always won through prayer. Then to verse 8. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. So here's, a, here's another way that you and I manage God's peace or are stewards of the gift of peace. I'm trying to learn this, just like prayer is a choice to hold on to peace. Uh, uh, we also make choices throughout our day that will either help us hold on to peace or we'll let it slip through our, through our fingertips. It's like, what are we feeding our minds? What kind of brain food are we having? Paul says, you want to hold on to peace? Then you've got to think about what you're, you're feeding your mind. You've got to think about your, your thought life. Do you know that every time we engage certain people, we are making a stewardship decision about our peace? Come on, everybody in the room, you got somebody in your life that you know, if I engage with them, chances of me losing my peace are very high. You don't have to name names. I know. I'm a person too. <laughs> so I'm not saying we can totally avoid them, but you've got to have wisdom on how you engage them. Do you have to engage them so much? Because every time you do, your peace level drops. Do you know every time we choose to turn on the news, we're making a stewardship decision about our peace? We don't need to be ignorant, but we were never designed to know about every scary thing that happens in every corner of the world every day. We're not built for that. We're, we're, just, we're just not built for that. God didn't design us, and, and from the, the vast majority of the stuff that's happening, there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> we weigh ourselves down by choosing to turn on that news channel. My dad's in the hospital, and, and I'm just amazed at uh, how many hospital waiting rooms that you're in, and the news is playing in the background. And, and I'm thinking, hey, y'all, this is supposed to be a place of healing. Turn that garbage off. <laughs> right? I mean, that, if, if, you want, if you want to be healed, you gotta get you got to get some of that stuff out of your mind. Do you know every time we open up social media, we're making a stewardship, stewardship, if I can say it, decision about our peace. Some of us know we're going we're gonna to encounter stuff on there that's going to steal our peace, and we click anyway. What's wrong with us? <laughs> right? That is self-inflicted. <laughs> Do you know that the data is in, the studies are in, and that our use of social media and our levels of anxiety and depression, they are in direct correlation with one another. The more time we spend on social media, the more depressed we are. Why do we do it? Some of us need to stop clicking and we'd find some peace. Thank you, one brother. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You know, every time we pull up a playlist on our phones, I'm talking about music. We're making a stewardship decision about our peace. I, 
I listen, sometimes you, you can't help but listen to someone else's music because they're in the car beside you and it's turned up to some ungodly level. And I'm thinking, that sister's in trouble. <laughs> right? That brother is in trouble. The words that he is putting into his heart and his mind and his spirit, there's no way he's dwelling in peace. I like all sorts of music, but man, when you put a song on about Jesus and you lift up holy hands to him and you begin to worship him and sing his praises and declare his promises, you talk about peace coming into your heart. You talk about peace coming into your home and flooding your mind. You can't get that with anything else. Can somebody say amen? We got to ask ourselves, God's given us the gift of peace, John 14, 27. Jesus says, my peace, I'm leaving it with you. But it's the choice I'm making right now, in this moment, this day, tomorrow morning. Are those choices going to help me maintain my peace? Or are they going to steal my peace? Are we dwelling on things that are true and noble and just and pure and have virtue and are praise worthy? Because Paul says if we, do, if we do, here's the promise in verse 9. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and here's the promise, the God of peace will be with you. Advent is the time leading up to Christmas where we redirect our hearts and focus on the things that Jesus brought at his first coming. Things like hope, things like joy. And our topic today, peace. I want to leave you with this. Peace in the world, you know, people say, hey, peace to you, peace to you. Or they'll give the peace sign or they got a bumper sticker on the back of their car, peace. But I want you to know this, peace is not a force. Peace is not a good vibe. Peace is not even really just an emotion. It's not even just the absence of fear. Peace is a person. Jesus. We go all the way back in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament prophets prophesied. They foretold that Christmas was going to happen. And here's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. He said, for unto us a child is born. This is written 700 years before this baby boy is born in that manger. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied that the Prince of Peace would come in the Old Testament, and then when Jesus was born, the angel declared, Peace is Will you stand with us today? I'm going to ask Pastor Stephen to come and close us out in prayer. Again, I don't mean to uh, keep belaboring things, but I just want to encourage. There are so many folks in the church going through some really difficult times today. I just want to encourage you. Keep bringing those things back to God. The things you can't control. The things that, you know what, it's beyond you. Just keep bringing them back over and over and over again to the Prince of Peace. Let's pray today. Let's pray, church. Lord, we just come and we, uh, we just ask that in this, uh, in this season and really in all seasons, help us to remember that it's often a still small voice in the midst of a lot of chaos that gives us peace. It's often taking a moment away and worshiping, allowing the Lord to fill us, allowing you to fill us, that allows us to have peace. Lord, help us to make wise choices. Let your spirit guide and direct us as we're deciding what we're going to consume and deciding what we're going to take into our minds. May we make choices that honor you. May we make choices that build us up in you and don't tear us down. Lord, protect us in that way. Give us accountability partners if we need it to help us to make wise choices. We're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for the way that you love us. We're thankful that you are the Prince of Peace. And we ask that you'd be with us as we go out this week, out of the church and into the battleground where there are lost people who need you. We love you, Lord. Pray these things in your name. Amen.